Microtik makes so many cool products, but where the heck do they even come from? That's a question I had, and so I did the only logical thing. I went out to Riga, Latvia, went to Microtik's headquarters, and even did a road trip to one of the contract manufacturers that makes these awesome Microtik products. So I'm gonna take you on an amazing tour of how Microtik products get made and show you why the company is actually a lot bigger than you probably think it is. One day I was sitting around and I was wondering like, hey, I wonder how the heck all of these things get made. And that happened about the same time that we did the Microtik Rose thing. And some of the comments that we always get is like, number one, Microtik is a small company, but number two, they're a Chinese company and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, if you just look at the boxes that are next to me, you're gonna see that all these little labels say made in Latvia. And guys, that distinction is super important. Whenever we do reviews of any product, even if it's from a large name brand manufacturer that everybody knows, or even smaller brands that are very inexpensive, a lot of folks ask like, hey, you know, what about the security supply chain, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of folks just frankly want devices that are made maybe not in the US or maybe they're made not in China. Maybe they want them to be made in places like the EU and Latvia is is an EU member nation. But of course, it's one thing to see labels on a box. It's totally different to actually see how the heck this happens. And so that really brought us to a little conversation. I said, hey, Microtech guys, what do you guys think about doing a video out there? And they were like, heck yes, let's go do that. And by the way, if you don't know where Latvia is, it's between Estonia and Lithuania. Of course, to get there, it took a lot of flights. I went on United from Phoenix to Newark, New Jersey, then from Newark, New Jersey to Rome, Italy. And then we did something fun on Air Baltic, which is flying through the Svalky Gap. I probably am saying that wrong, but it's the little gap between Poland and Lithuania that separates Belarus and Kaliningrad. I just want to point out that I was absolutely shocked with how nice Riga was. Now, of course, we're doing this in the summer, and I would imagine that my experience would be very different if I were there in January. Riga has gone through so many transitions, and it's been around for so long. I mean, it's been occupied by many different forces over different world wars, and so it's just one of those places that has history going all the way back from the medieval era all the way to today and all, all of this stuff in between, and that just makes it kind of exciting. Next, we're going to go to Microtech's headquarters, which is over here. Now, I just want to say thank you really quickly to St. Peter's Church, who's allowed us to come up here. You're normally not supposed to film up here, but this place is absolutely beautiful and gives you an amazing view of Riga. So if you're ever here, come check it out. The factory that Microtech has been in has been around for so long. For over 100 years, this area and this campus have been used for manufacturing. Examples of things that have been manufactured here are things like radios, but also the super tiny Soviet spy cameras were made on this campus. So I didn't know what to expect from a 100-year-old factory building. I mean, would Microtik's offices look like this one? But once you get inside, you realize that you're definitely not in a factory that was built in the 1800s, right? This facility is modern and it looks very much like any Silicon Valley hardware company. And you're gonna see this giant indoor climbing wall that I was told was the tallest indoor climbing wall in the Baltics when it was built. So how does a product at Microtik get started? Well, there are a few folks here that will hear requirements either from customers or they'll just have an idea for a product. And then the next step is to go with the team and figure out, okay, at a high level, what are the components or do the components exist? to make something like they're thinking of. And once they have a high level idea, they can green light that from a financial standpoint, say like, I think we can make this product. And then the design happens, which is really the big work. So what you'll see in the floors below me is that there are a number of engineers and they cover a whole bunch of different disciplines. Those disciplines could be things like doing the electronic design. Also, you know, folks have to design the different PCBs. Once those are made, there's also mechanical design for all the housings and all the fittings and what have you. But then there's also teams over here that do things like the software, where you might know router OS as an example. Still, all these new platforms have new hardware, which require things like firmware and drivers to be built and integrated and tested into router OS and other platforms. So this is something that has to happen at this stage, which is really that software design along with the hardware. Now, of course, we can't show you all the designs because they're for future products. But after the design work is done, the next step is to prototype because you have to know if what you designed actually works before you send it to manufacturing. And that's also done here. So for example, there are things like pick place machines, wave soldering machines, all kinds of different machines 
that are on site to be able to go and take bare PCBs and actually build components, even if they're you know at a smaller volume, right? But just if you wanted to go build a couple prototype components, you can do that here. There's also 3D printers and what have you for doing those first sets of mechanical parts and stuff so you can start building the mechanical design and really start to see a part take shape. All that can happen on site here. One other important use for this prototyping facility behind me is that every once in a while, now especially if you're in the electronics industry, you know this happens, where you'll have parts that end up end of lifing early or there's some kind of allocation or some kind of supply chain disruption. And so you have to start substituting components and it happens more than I think most folks outside of the industry realize. And so having these prototyping facilities on site allows Microtix engineers to go and make those substitutions, try out replacement parts and start testing them before they have to go into manufacturing. That also means that everything down the chain, including some of the optical inspections, needs to be updated to take into account the fact that you might be using new parts. Now with these prototype designs, the next step is really doing a ton of testing because you have to make sure before you send the prototype to manufacturing that you have something that is going to work. And that means doing testing on the mechanical design, the electrical design, doing all kinds of things for temperature, humidity. There's also a huge RF testing facility here. And the reason for that is that Microtech needs to test all kinds of different radio types, right? There's Wi-Fi, because there's a lot of products that include Wi-Fi, but there's other things and a lot more complex in some ways because they do things like mobile networks. So you have to have 5G, you have to have LTE, 3G networks. And so there's an entire testing lab with the local carrier downstairs and we even went up to the roof where we got to see the poles that Microtech actually takes and they put up on the pole on the top of the building and they will go and make longer distance links so if you have to go 15 kilometers that can be tested from the top of the building and by the way I heard a rumor that some of the folks doing the testing are actually the engineers that take them home and test those long-range links before the products go to manufacturing Once a prototype design is complete, the next step is to go to manufacturing. But you can't just say like, oh, here's my prototype design, go manufacture it. So when you have a contract manufacturer build something, especially if it's a custom thing like Microtech makes, you need to make sure that the factory can validate that what they produce actually works. And so Microtech has an entire team that builds these robotic test fixtures that can see everything from, you know, were cables inserted properly, do the chips power on properly, but also even things down to like do the LEDs actually show through the case as you would expect. Once those test fixtures are made and the manufacturing lines are designed, the next step is to actually have the contract manufacturer build the products. So what you do is you don't necessarily go and build like a huge volume of products all at one go. What you usually would want to do is build a small batch. The contract manufacturer will set up the line. They'll go do a couple of runs and they'll go, you know, produce a couple of the products. They'll go through the testing process, validate that they work, and then they'll send them back to Microtech. Microtech then sets all of those up. And their next step is they do large scale testing. So instead of just testing a couple prototype units, they're now testing a bunch of units that come off of the contract manufacturer's line. Then once that's validated, the contract manufacturer is given the green light to go and do volume manufacturing. So for that, I think the next step is we need to go to Hansa Matrix to go look at what high volume manufacturing of Microtech products looks like here in Latvia. Now I'm here in Ventspils, which is about a three hour drive from Riga here at Hansa Matrix. Now Hansa Matrix has been a contract manufacturer for Microtech for many years. And we're gonna go see the production lines where some of the really cool Microtech products are being built today. And I can't wait to show you inside, so let's get to it. Now the entire process starts here on the loading dock. Materials come in from trucks and they're going over here to the materials handling area. It's also where finished goods are shipped out of. Now the raw materials after they're received come here to the inspection station. You can see that I have an entire just block of PCBs here where they need to go and be inspected. And if things fail quality inspection, they end up over here where the parts that don't meet standards end up because they end up uh, not making it into the products, right? And now we're in the unpackaging area of the warehouse where raw materials come in in their boxes but then they need to be you know unboxed 
and then placed into these bins. So you'll see things like covers to products where they'll go and they'll get binned over here. And then eventually these bins will make their way onto the production floor will be put together into products. Now we're in the plastic injection molding facility. And this machine behind me is super cool. It's actually running right now, making some little cases for some Microtik products. And what you're gonna see on the side over here is that we have the material. This is really the raw plastic material that then goes and gets fed into the injection molding machine. And it takes a couple seconds, but once it's done, the machine spreads apart. And then a little robot arm picks up the newly molded parts and puts them onto a conveyor belt where they then check for quality and also if any rework is needed. Now I'm here on the giant manufacturing floor where all of the magic happens. Now this side is really dedicated more for assembly and we'll also take you over to the other side, which is where all the pick place machines, wave soldering machines and all of that type of process for the PCBs happen. So we're gonna show you everything in this factory. So of course, because this is a manufacturing facility, we have to track a number of KPIs like the safety, the quality, the performance and the people, which is done behind me on these boards. So now I'm on the production floor and you'll see reels of components that are gonna go into the pick place machines that are over there, but they have to be staged on the side, ready to go and fill the pick place machines. So next to me are the pick place machines. And if you've never seen one of these work, they take reels of little components and they place them onto the PCBs very precisely. And then they also have to make sure that they're putting them in the right place. They're kind of like an inkjet printer or maybe a 3D printer in a way. And the little flashes that happen in these machines are actually photos that are essentially being taken so that way you can verify that components were placed correctly. If you ever get a chance to see these in real life, definitely go do it. So after the boards go through the series of pick and place machines over there, the boards come out and they come into this little box, which literally just turns the boards 90 degrees. And then it goes along the track over here and you can see one going right there into the oven. This entire thing is there to make sure that those components that were just placed are firmly affixed to the board. The next step is they need to get an optical inspection using AI, of course, because it's 2025. There's a optical inspection, so an image is taken and it's compared against what the board should look like. So once the boards go through inspection, they're then sorted into good and bad boards and then the good boards can move on in the process the boards that need additional work go over to the rework stations that are right over here. And so behind me is the wave soldering machine. So through hole components are being placed over there by technicians, and then they go through the flexor and then through the wave soldering machine. And that's what really all those big, you know, through, through hole components, that's what solders them onto the PCB. Now, Microtik makes a lot of smaller products and you'll see that those come in a larger PCB with multiple little boards on there. So this machine next to me is the CNC machine that actually cuts all of the boards out of the larger PCB assembly. So this is the conformal coating area and some devices, especially when you have things deployed at the edge, need to have special coatings to make sure that they're able to withstand environments that they're in. And that's exactly what these are for. This behind me is a dip station. So you have a little robot arm that dips the components that need to go or the PCBs into the little vat of coating material. And then over on the other side over here, there's a little bit more targeted one with little nozzles that it can place coatings exactly where it's needed. This entire process ensures that if you are putting those components that need to go into harsher environments or need those different environmental ratings, that you can get the right coatings on top of those parts. Now, after the boards come off of the manufacturing line, they come over here where the boards are first scanned. That's where they get their labels with their serial numbers and all of that kind of information. And then they go into testing. Now there's different types of testing. You'll see that we have some stuff for the wired uh, portions of the boards over here. Over on this side, there's actually a whole area for doing the wireless testing and calibration. And then once the products are fully tested, they're assembled and put into their plastic housings. In this case, just behind me over here. And just to give you some idea of some of the cool test fixtures that they have, this is for the Microtik RDS server. So if you wanna go see the video on that one on the STH YouTube channel, we'll link that one in the description. But you can see over here that we have the SSDs. So there's a set of SSDs that can be used to validate the NVMe functionality. Then there's also power. So there's fixed power, so you can go and test the power supplies. And then also network, so you can go and test that network functionality all in one test fixture, which is just a cool custom piece of equipment that's here. 
here. So around me, this is one of the manufacturing cells. So if you're gonna manufacture something that's a complex product, like the Microtik RDS server that we looked at previously, well, this is kind of how you would do it. So you'd have materials that would come in over here, then they would go over to this section where they could be tested and all of the things like the scans could happen for all the barcodes and what have you. And then on this side over here, you have additional components that could be added. And you'll see that there are things like screwdrivers. So as these are you know, screwed into their chassis and what have you, that can happen here with the right screwdrivers to have the right torque and all that. So all the materials are brought into this manufacturing cell. And then the entire assemblies can be built because you can go and pick the different parts that you need, put them together, assemble them, and then test them and get everything done all in one area without having to move material across the manufacturing floor. And behind me, they're doing the exact opposite process that we do in our studio, where we take things apart after they've been shipped and all that. They're actually assembling these, putting all the screws together, the chassis, and getting that final assembly done. And so it's just kind of fun to see that these folks are doing the exact opposite of what we do. Now in the packaging area where we are right now, that's where all of the things that you find in a Microtik box end up making their way there. We have everything from the boxes to the power adapters, all the little bits and bobs, the antennas, even the units themselves, down to the labels. That all has to get assembled here, and that's what gets packaged up and then eventually brought over to the loading dock. They are boxed up, then palletized, and then they come here to the shipping dock, where they then make their way onto the trucks and make their way to you. Microtik also has other facilities in places like Lithuania and stuff that they use in the EU. And these are really for kind of their higher value products. And something frankly sad that I didn't know is that it's actually hard to get things manufactured in Northeastern Europe at this point because so much of the factory capacity is going towards building drones for Ukraine. So kind of, kind of a morbid thing as we're going and doing this tour that I just wanna make sure everybody's aware of because I had no idea. And hey guys, while I was there, I got to see a sneak peek of some new products that we just can't show you in this video. Stay tuned on the STH main site because we're gonna show you a couple of them there. We also got to look at some kind of further off products, which I thought was really cool. I also got to go to dinner with John Tolley, who is one of the founders and also now runs Microtech. His story was really interesting. He was telling me about, you know, he went to university and then he started working with the National Airline at the time. And then that kind of led into, you know, the 90s era where all this networking was happening. That was an era where everybody was in this VC fueled frenzy of building very expensive network gear because you had companies like Cisco and all the others that were building large networking businesses, but they were really focused on large enterprises and people that had a lot of money. But at the same time, there was a big opportunity to help provide connectivity for all of those folks that frankly don't have those kind of budgets. The idea was being able to put something like router OS or a software solution that could do a lot of that routing and give you a lot of features that you would get maybe on the higher end boxes, but just at a much lower cost, maybe being able to run on small x86 systems systems and just low cost systems of the era, that was a huge win because it democratized that network access. And so ever since then, what you've seen is Microtech has really been growing up and they've grown from, you know, those kind of really low cost, low end edge products to now we're starting to see products with 100 gigabit ethernet. And uh, well, well, we'll see when this video is published, but I don't think they're going to stop there. And hey guys, I just wanna say thank you to all the STH YouTube members who have joined down below and are providing the budget for us to go and do this. That paid for the plane tickets and all the travel and stuff to be able to go and film this video. We wouldn't have been able to do it without that. Also, I have to say thank you to Microtech for opening up and allowing us to go film all of this stuff. Just getting to go and show this all off, I thought was amazing and I hope you guys enjoy this. I just wanna keep doing tours of cool things in the industry. So if you have other ideas, feel free to let me know down in the comments. Why don't you give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.